Hello, and welcome to the latest Expert Series webinar. Today's webinar is Take Advantage of Market Inefficiency with Fundamental Indexes. This is a complimentary ETF.com webinar, courtesy of Russell Indexes and Charles Schwab. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the Managing Editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today are Rolf Agather. He is the Managing Director of Research and Innovation for Russell Investments, a family of global indexes. Also joining me both from Charles Schwab, first Anthony Davidow. He's the Vice President uh, in charge of Alternative Data and Asset Allocation Strategies at the Schwab Center for Financial Research. Also from Schwab is Michael Savage, who's here today. Uh, he is with Charles Schwab Investment Managers Services Group. He is a managing director and portfolio strategist responsible for strategy and market communications with clients and partners for the Schwab Fundamental Index Strategies. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to know that you can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. We will have a Q&A at the end of the formal presentations, and I may ask a few questions along the way. John Bogle of Vanguard may not like it, but the humble index fund he championed in the mid-1970s now has competition from within the world of indexing. Investors indeed are willing to embrace the inexpensive, pure beta capitalization-weighted index strategies marketed by companies including Vanguard, iShares, and Charles Schwab. But crucially, they've also indicated that they still want outsized returns if they can get them. The problem is that investors are also increasingly skeptical about the track records of all but a handful of active mutual fund strategies to outperform, and not least, they're a lot less willing to pay up for active management. Enter the world of fundamental indexing. This is a different way to access the investable universe through indexing screens that can deliver bigger returns. People call it everything from alternative beta, enhanced beta, even smart beta. I just call it a babble of beta. And Rob Arnott, one of the pioneers of this movement in indexing, calls it fundamental indexing. That's because he's developed indexes that weight securities in a portfolio based on fundamental factors such as earnings, revenue, book value, and earnings instead of just the price of the security, as is the case with cap-weighted indexes. The takeaway is this. Here's a possible way to outperform pure beta indexes and at a fraction of the cost of bona fide active management. This idea has taken off in the past few years since the first alternative beta funds were rolled out more than a decade ago. We can get into what constitutes alternative beta. That's a complicated discussion, but about 200 billion U.S. ETF assets are now benchmarked to such screens according to the research we've done here at ETF.com. That figure of $200 billion includes fundamental indexes, and that matters because today we're going to look closely at a lineup of fundamental ETFs sponsored by Charles Schwab using Russell indexes designed by Rob Arnott's firm, Research Affiliates. Those six fundamental ETFs launched by Schwab have together gathered about $400 million. One more sign to us at ETF.com that this phenomenon definitely has legs. Call it a value tilt, a dynamic value tilt, as Rob Arnott calls it, but all these assets and fundamental ETFs are nothing to scoff at any longer, especially now that the earliest strategies that were brought to market have five years of real-world returns that legitimizes claims that these funds can outperform pure beta indexes. So let's get right into it, and we'll start with Rolf Agather of Russell Indexes. Rolf, take it away. Well, thank you, Ollie, and thanks to everybody in the audience for taking the time to participate in this webinar. So as you can see by the title, we are going to be talking about taking advantage of some less efficient markets with the fundamental index. So for those of you that have attended other fundamental index sessions, you know that we normally talk about more developed markets, such as the U.S. and other developed ex-U.S. markets. And we can talk about some of the characteristics and benefits of fundamental indexes in those particular environments. But today we're going to look at a, at a less efficient market, uh, in particular emerging markets. And we're going to try and, and understand how the characteristics of the fundamental index can provide, continue to provide some of the benefits that we've seen in other markets as well. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a brief background for those that might not be as familiar with the fundamental index. So I'll talk a little bit about the methodology, but then I'll follow that with some high-level observations about why fundamental might work particularly well in emerging markets. Following that, Tony and Mike will do a deeper dive into the structure of the index and also some of the Schwab products. And then, as Ollie mentioned, finally, we'll leave time, hopefully, for plenty of question and answers. Uh, now, you'll notice today that our colleagues at Research Affiliates are not on the panel, but I did want to take this time to, to recognize that the Russell Fundamental Indexes are a result of a combined effort between Russell and Research Affiliates. So Russell brings substantial experience in developing institutional quality indexes that can be used both as benchmarks and as investable products. Research Affiliates obviously has substantial experience in global tactical asset allocation, and as Ollie mentioned, they are the pioneer and continue to be one of the strongest proponents for the fundamental methodology. And as you can see here, I think it's interesting that we're, we're just about going on 10 years from the development and launch of the fundamental index concept, and it's got about $120 billion of AUM following some version of that strategy. So I think that's truly uh, been a remarkable achievement. And again, just want to take the time to recognize our colleagues at Research Affiliates for being pioneers in this space. So before we talk about the fundamental index methodology, just want to make some general comments about market cap weighted indexes, because these tend to be what most people are familiar with when they think about indexes. So obviously the S&P 500 and the Russell 1000 are really two of the most widely used indexes that we use to gauge the performance of U.S. large cap stocks. Now both of these types of indexes are what we call cap weighted, which means we basically use their current market price of the stocks in those indexes as a way of weighting the, the particular companies in the index. So companies that have a higher market capitalization, which is shares times price, will tend to have a higher weight in the index and vice versa. Now the benefits of this is Cap weighting is, is a, an accurate picture of the market. Um, so it can provide a reliable benchmark for understanding how the market's behaving. For investors that are making active decisions or, or using advisors or other active managers to make, make decisions for them, um, indexes are the best representation of what that opportunity set looks like. And Russell believes that we still want to always use cap weighting as our reference point for measuring those active decisions. And also, Cap-weighted indexes can be used as the basis for investment products. So again, many investors already use a form of a market cap-weighted index to, to gain investment exposure with a recognition that what you're really doing is accepting the basic market exposure and that you don't have any particular insights or forecasts about whether certain stocks will do better than the others or certain segments of the markets will do better than the others as well. Now, there are some known limitations to cap-weighted indexes. Most specifically is that because we're using the price as the mechanism for weighting and the price is also representative of performance, cap-weighted indexes will tend to overweight stocks that have been overpriced and also they'll underweight stocks that have been underpriced. So what happens is cap-weighting can create pretty high concentrations in hot sectors and industries. So most investors are familiar with the tech bubble of the late 90s. This was a case where tech companies were being very, very highly valued and, and potentially cap-weighted indexes were, were becoming very concentrated in these types of stocks. And so the impact is when the bubble bursts, those companies also tend to, to experience very negative performance. And because they've had such high weights in the index, they can cause dramatic, dra dramatic decline in performance for investors holding those types of strategies. So it's important to recognize that cap-weighted indexing, while it does have many benefits, there are also some drawbacks. They're not perfect. And investors need to understand these dynamics. So where do fundamental indexes fit? So as, as Ollie mentioned, um, you know, we generally think about fundamental as one of many and increasing number of smart beta indexes. And at Russell, we generally define smart beta indexes as transparent and rules-based investment strategies designed to provide exposure to market segments, other factors, or even specific investment strategies. And potentially what a common characteristic of these types of smart beta strategies is that they're not market cap weighted. So clearly fundamental was one of the first non-cap weighted indexes to come out to the market. But increasingly, many new smart beta indexes are following these same sorts of principles as well. Now fundamental doesn't explicitly target any sort of risk factor. But as we'll talk about later, it does produce certain factors that can vary over time because of its unique methodology. So just talking a little bit more about the methodology we use to construct the fundamental index, 
as I mentioned, we aren't going to use price as the weighting variable. In the Russell Fundamental Series, we use adjusted sales, retained cash flow, and dividends plus buybacks. Now, these metrics are very objective measures of relative size, so they're not subject to the, the whims of the marketplace or the consensus view at any point in time of, of all investors trying to predict future value. Uh, they're generally widely acceptable forms of company size. It's, it's usually more difficult to gain these sorts of, of variables in, from an accounting standpoint. Um, and we also find, and in particularly relevant to today's conversation, these measures are generally available across markets. So we generally are able to get information on sales, cash flow, and dividends for emerging markets, just as we are for developed markets. And potentially most importantly, these metrics are not correlated with price. So to the extent that there are market bubbles or market crashes, we find that these measures tend to be more stable and tend to provide a more consistent weighting for, for companies in the index. Just as an example to show this process before moving on, um, Here's a simple example where we're showing just for a handful of companies how this process might work to determine their ultimate weight in the Russell Fundamental Index. So if you look at this example for these five companies, we show the particular weight and then the relative rank of each of these companies for each of the variables. So if we simply use adjusted sales as the measure for ranking companies, you can see here that ExxonMobil would be the, the, the stock with the highest weight. J.P. Morgan would be number 86 in this list. If you look at retained cash flow, all of a sudden J.P. Morgan now would have been the top ranked stock because of its cash flow, ExxonMobil would be number three. When you then look at dividends plus buybacks, once again ExxonMobil is back to the number one rank and J.P. Morgan is, is number 30. We then take an average of these three weights to produce the fundamental weight. So as you can see, big companies like ExxonMobil are still going to be represented with a large weight in the index but that's not necessarily going to be true for, for every company. So there may be some companies that are very large and have high weights in a market capitalization index that potentially do not have as high a weight in the fundamental index because of this process. So with this background on, on methodology, I'd like to talk a little bit more about how the fundamental index behaves in emerging markets. Now I think it's important to recognize that the same general principles that we talk about with fundamental indexes remain. So we're still talking about a strategy that's, that's very much passive investing. So the rules for these indexes are transparent. There's no active decisions being made. We're still capturing broad market exposure, which gives us diversification, capacity, and ideally low due diligence and monitoring costs. And as we're going to see, historically, in, in back-tested simulations, we can see where the fundamental methodology has produced higher absolute and risk-adjusted returns across a wide variety of markets. And now this has been acknowledged that some of this comes from having either a value or small cap bias, but we also know that some of it comes from this disciplined rebalancing that fundamental employs. So we, to the extent we want to represent a company at its fundamental weight, market movements will start to deviate or drift that company away over time. And so it's important in our rebalancing process to continually bring that stock's weight back to its fundamental value. And so we think this is an important source of potential, potential performance that can be achieved from the fundamental index. So let's take a high-level look at emerging uh, markets. And I think what's important to recognize here is that emerging markets are generally less efficient. And, and what that means is prices of emerging market stocks tend to be more noisy. So if you think about what the fundamental index methodology is exploiting, it really should be expected to do better with noisy prices. So to the extent that, that there's a lot of noise in prices, potentially more companies are being overvalued and more companies are being undervalued. And as we mentioned, in a cap-weighted index, those overvalued companies will tend to be overweighted and those undervalued companies will, will tend to be underweighted. And the fundamental index takes advantage of that fact. So just as we think about less efficient markets, we already have an expectation for how fundamental index might work. And what actually creates these inefficiencies is things like less analyst coverage. So generally there are fewer analysts making estimates or forecasts about emerging market company, company behavior. There's also higher earnings variability, which then tends to translate into more variability in individual stock prices. And also emerging markets tend to have a high amount of dispersion in terms of the, the stock returns being produced. And generally, when you have higher market dispersion, there's a bigger payoff to making active bets that are correct. So for all these reasons that are being created by this noisy prices and inefficiencies, we can see that the fundamental index is actually able to benefit even greater in these markets than it does in more developed markets. 
So if you look at this performance chart, it's, it's roughly a 15-year period from middle of 1996 through March of this year. One of the first observations I would make is over this fairly long period, one of the things you'll see is really emerging markets did not do as well as developed markets. So the Russell Emerging Markets Large Cap Index, the annualized return was 6.6% over this period, whereas the U.S. Um, Russell 1000 Index performance was 82 and the developed ex-U.S. Large Cap Index was 6.5. So really, this was a period where the U.S. market in general was doing better than emerging markets. Now, obviously, what you'll notice is for each of these types of markets, you'll notice the fundamental index does better. So starting at the bottom, if you look at the developed XUS series, the excess return of the fundamental developed XUS index was almost 300 basis points higher than its cap-weighted counterpart. The excess return was similar for the U.S. large cut fundamental index, about 300 basis points of excess return over the Russell 1000. But what's most dramatic, and, and pointing to my comments about inefficiencies, is the fundamental emerging markets index added almost 600 basis points of return beyond the cap-weighted emerging markets index. So I think we'd all agree that this is pretty substantial excess return. And while we don't necessarily, we shouldn't necessarily expect this to continue in the future, clearly what we've seen historically is that the fundamental methodology is taking advantage of this higher inefficiency in emerging markets, such that even in a period where emerging markets in a cap-weighted framework weren't doing that well, the fundamental methodology added significant value. And I think it's also important to recognize that this really didn't come by increasing the risk. So the standard deviation of the fundamental index in emerging markets was still around 25%, just as its cap-weighted counterpart. Uh, Rolf, uh, can I yeah. chime in here? It's Ollie. Uh, I, I represent the interest of the peanut gallery, so excuse me if I'm being uh, sure. a little impolite. Uh, but is there anything distinct about the July 96 to March 2014 period that might skew these returns in the favor of fundamental. What I mean, a lot has a lot went on there, right? We have the internet bubble. We have uh, right. you know a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Is, is it distinct in historical perspective, or can we think of that slice of time as sort of meaningful in a statistical sense from which we can extract uh, meaningful conclusions about these comparative uh, analyses on returns? Yeah, that's a great point, Ollie. And I think you know what we're trying to accomplish here is to look over basically the longest period of time for, that we have available for the index. And so the the index data itself was created in J July 1996, or the first data point we have. So what this represents is the you know the single longest period where we have data. And you know, and I definitely you know think it's important to you know affirm your comment that you know this this particular type of analysis can be time period dependent. And so it is important to look across a, a range of market cycles when we're evaluating performance. And so I think it's important, you know, actually this brings me to my next slide, where as we start to look at, you know, various market cycles, we can, you know, start to drill in a little bit to what might be causing some of this performance. Now, this is an example where, you know, we can look at rolling three-year returns and basically measure where the returns of the fundamental emerging markets index outperformed the cap-weighted index. Now, normally when we show this chart for, let's say, the U.S. market, you will see periods of underperformance, which in this case you're not seeing until the very end of the period. So generally in the, the time period leading up to the technology bubble in the late 90s, you would have seen the fundamental index in the U.S. underperform. And again, this is, this is a, a, the reason for this is because of the known value tilt of fundamental. So generally value strategies did not do well when tech stocks were, were basically on the rise. Um, and so in the U.S., you would have seen that sort of underperformance. Similarly, in the, the years leading up to the, the global financial crisis of 2008, you would have seen potentially, again, value strategies not doing well, and fundamental would have, would have shown some underperformance. In this version, and we're looking, at, we're looking at outperformance here, right, versus the Russell cap-weighted index, right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. So again, I think what's, what's unique here, so in the U.S. version of this particular chart, we would have seen some periods of underperformance generally when value strategies didn't do well. But once again, because of the overall inefficiency of emerging markets, what we're seeing here is even in periods where, you know, potentially emerging markets didn't do well or potentially in periods where value strategies didn't do well, because of the inefficiencies of that market and the, the way that the fundamental index potentially takes advantage of those, it always achieved some amount of excess performance some, up until the very latest period. So what we're seeing is obviously some of that inefficiency is coming down. Prices potentially now are, are less noisy now than they were in the past. Um, so you know, when you start to see more sort of 
periods of stability in these markets, when prices get less noisy, you know, then I think you, know, you don't necessarily see this effect as pronounced in recent time periods. But clearly in any of these sort of you know, either crisis-driven or, or bubble-type environments, you see this kind of effect. So you know, that, that's really my high-level comment. So I, I just want to stop there. And you know, so I've reviewed the methodology, you know, talked a little bit about you know, why fundamental, the fundamental index methodology behaves the way it does in emerging markets. And so now what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll let Tony uh, provide a, a deeper look at the emerging markets and some of the characteristics of the fundamental index and how it differs from the traditional cap-weighted indexes. And I think this will also you know, help us get to some more, a, a deeper explanation of, of what's going on um, that, that's creating these sorts of performance patterns. Thanks, Rolf. And, Ali, I will get to your question because I've got some data in here that looks at uh, uh, the performance over rolling three-year time periods, as, as Rolf just indicated, and, and, and I think you'll find some interesting uh, tidbits of information. I, I do want to share with everyone some research that we've recently completed. We actually just published a white paper on emerging markets where the title is Countries and Companies Matter. Uh, which gives you a sense of what we're going to cover over the next couple minutes here. Uh, but we do think it's very important. Everyone's paying attention to what's happening in the emerging market these days. Uh, you know, clearly the average individual will have a tough time picking individual companies, and the average consumer would have a tough time distinguishing which company, which countries to own and which countries to sell. So we'll, we'll go through a, a series of options that might be available in the marketplace. We'll share some of the research that we've done, and then ultimately we'll kind of close things out with some analysis that we've done looking at these fundamental strategies relative to the market cap equivalents. So if I just focus on you know, the executive summary and what we're trying to cover here, clearly the emerging markets represent significant risks and opportunities. And I think the challenge is how then should individual investors get exposure to those market segments. Um, and I think often, unfortunately, we generalize and, and assume that all the emerging markets are created equally and all of those decisions will uh, ultimately yield the same results over time. We, we'll obviously get into that, and that's certainly not the case. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the differences in country allocations, and, and the differences in country allocations uh, we'll, we'll cover will have a pretty pronounced impact on the portfolios over time. And then I'll also talk a little bit about how it's really important to distinguish the companies that you own and invest in. And we'll close things out with a discussion of market cap and fundamentally weighted strategies and share some of the historical results that, that we've been looking at over time. I think as a jumping off point, I, I think we need to start with China. Uh, China certainly is a, a behemoth. You know, they're, they're a big economy. Uh, you know, they've, they've been a powerhouse for nearly 200 years, and there's this great quote from Bert Melchior from Wall Street to the Great Wall reminds us all that China has been a world power for a very long time. And with the size and the demographics they have working for them, more than likely they will continue to be a very dominant player on the world stage going forward. And, and they're a very important component of what happens in emerging economies, not just because of their individual growth, but they are also consuming a lot of the raw materials that generate a lot of the excess returns that we've seen out of many of these related markets. So I, I do think China is a good jumping off point, and, and certainly it's something that we should all be watching carefully how they're growing, uh, will they have a hard landing and a, and a slow landing, and if their economy slows, what impact does that have on some of the uh, neighboring uh, countries and some of their trading partners? What I thought was interesting, though, and, and maybe this is where we'll start to get into the meat of the discussion, is if we look at some of the best and worst performing emerging markets, what we start to see is there's some pretty big differences over time. And I, I certainly don't expect everyone to read the numbers on the screen, although I think afterwards you'll have an opportunity to review the slides. But this very busy chart shows us the best and the worst performing emerging markets on a year-over-year -year basis. And you'll notice China in uh, 2007 was the best performing market. But since that period of time, it's actually been middle of the pack to lower end of, of the pack. Um, and then if I, I draw your attention yet again to Turkey, where Turkey was the top performing market in 2012, it then dropped precipitously in 2013. The, the point of this chart is to say that although these are all grouped together, uh, they perform quite differently over time. They're, they're impacted by different geopolitical risks. 
They're different by they're impacted by different uh, import and export uh, trade imbalances, uh, geopolitical risk, uh, political instability. Uh, we're certainly seeing that with Russia today. So although they're often grouped together, we'd argue they're really quite different, and they're going to react and respond to different fundamentals over time. Uh, we, we certainly think of the emerging market as one big grouping, but we have seen a lot of uh, noise coming out about the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China. That's certainly been a popular acronym for quite some time, and the belief was those four economies would kind of lead the emerging market forward. But more recently, we've started to see acronyms like MENA, Middle East, North, and Northern Africa, or MINT, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria or Turkey, or even the Fragile Five, which refers to some economies that are very suspect and uh, likely will have some uh, difficult times in front of them. The Fragile Five are Brazil, India, Indonesia, Turkey, and South Africa. And the, the point is, it's very difficult to generalize how these economies are going to perform and how these countries are going to perform over time. So our point is, not all emerging markets are created equal. We should not assume the same outcomes when we think about the individual companies. And most investors really lack the time and the wherewithal to determine which individual country they should get exposure to and when they should exit a particular country. So again, we'd argue that broad baskets of stocks and broad exposures in an index strategy allows you to diversify your risk in this very volatile market segment. I did want to drill down a little bit more. Uh, Rolf covered, you know, the difference in methodologies between a fundamental strategy and emerging market uh, market cap weighted strategies. And what I've done on the slide is really just depicted the top ten holdings of the Russell Fundamental Emerging Market and the Russell Emerging Market Index. Now, of course, the the, the Russell Emerging Market Index is market cap weighted, which means the largest company has largest weight. There's nothing scientific about that other than bigger is better in the emerging markets uh, in the market cap uh, version. What's interesting is if you look at the Russell Fundamental Emerging Market, and they are based on fundamental factors, securities are screened and weighted based on things like adjusted sales, cash flow, dividends, plus buyback, you actually see very similar names but very different weightings over time. Not surprisingly, the top two names are Lukol and uh, Gazprom, and unfortunately those are both Russian oil companies, and they've been hit hard recently. But you will see very different uh, weightings that, that, are, that apply to each one of these indices, and it's really a byproduct of the methodology and the discipline, and, and I would just caution you that as you look at all of these alternative weighting methodologies, spend the time to understand what the weighting methodology is, spend the time to understand what the differences in weighting means to returns over time. I think as Rolf pointed out, a lot of the excess return has come historically by really having somewhat of a, a, a counter bet on where the market is, removing some of the momentum, and breaking the link with price. So the top ten holdings start to give us a picture of how these two underlying strategies, which own similar baskets of stocks, uh, actually provide very different port, uh, portfolio characteristics over time. Another way of looking at it is if we look at the country allocations across these two strategies. And again, I'll draw your attention to the emerging market uh, fundamental version. And what you'll see is this strategy is overweighting South Korea, Brazil, and Russia, and underweighting China. And again, it's not a, it's not a forward-looking tactical call. It's a byproduct of the discipline. And again, trying to identify strong companies and where they're domiciled is, is really not part of the equation at all, but you get very different outcomes over time. I'll give you one other snapshot, one other way of looking at that, and that is if we were to look at the sector allocations across the Russell Fundamental and the Russell Emerging, what you'll notice here is the Russell Fundamental version is overweighting utilities, material, and energies, and underweighting financial services, consumer staples, and consumer discretionary. And again, it's a byproduct of the discipline. Nobody's making an active call on that. But what you start to realize is the portfolio construction varies quite a bit over time based on that methodology. Now, of course, let's get to the punchline and, and the reason that this is so important. And, and this is similar to what Rolf had shown, and, and I'll just draw your attention to where it's slightly different, is Rolf's data was actually through the end of March. My data is through the end of the year. 
And what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the, the return comparison where, similar to Rolf's data, uh, you'll see that 600 basis points plus of excess return. Um, I will also show you, and Ali, I think this was specific to your question, is what we've looked at is we've looked at uh, the comparisons over rolling three-year time periods, and we've looked at the batting average. And the Russell fundamental outperforms the Russell emerging out of each and every one of these rolling three-year time periods going back over time. So it's not just one period of time that gives you that excess returns. It's fairly consistent. Now, the magnitude of the outperformance will certainly vary over time, but we thought this was an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, so it's a little bit different in the way that Rolf looked at it, but similar conclusions in that pretty substantial excess return coming from these fundamental strategies over time. Uh, Tony, can you just take a crack? I'm looking back at that chart. If you could just go back to page 20. Can you uh, toggle back? Yep. Thank you. Um, there is a divergence that, sort, that starts to manifest uh, at the end of the last century, uh, right around the time when the Internet bubble was beginning to unravel, and certainly accelerated as it completely unraveled, uh, working through that bear market early in this decade or in the first decade of the century. Um, can you comment on what maybe it is that we're seeing there? Is that is that what uh, what we uh, talk about when we talk about th this having a value tilt on some level? Well, I, I'm not sure it's a, a value tilt that's really driving it. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is it's really a, a point in time where the country allocations and the companies you're investing really matter quite a bit. And if you go back to Rolf's data, Rolf had some interesting data showing um, – Pretty, pretty substantial outperformance, and he actually showed the spikiness kind of in the early phases of the market. But I do think that there is a difference over time in how you're allocating, um, and, and I think that you're rewarded for it by making intelligent decisions. I think that's why the, the term smart beta has been used in the marketplace. If you can make intelligent decisions on how you're allocating capital based on the strength of a company rather than arbitrarily weighting based on a company being large, I think you're going to get a different outcome over time. Thank you. Let me just kind of close up, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mike Savage. Again, I think as we've covered here, uh, the emerging markets represents both risks and opportunities, and we just want to be careful as we think about getting exposure here. We think it's difficult to group all of these markets together and assume that you're going to get the same outcomes for each one of those market segments. Uh, we do think it matters when you think about your country exposure, and it certainly matters a great deal when you think about which companies you're providing the largest weighting to over time. As much as individual investors have choices in how they get exposure, we think it's very challenging to determine which individual securities or which individual countries they should be investing in. Uh, you know, fortunately today people have many options. They can invest in funds and SMAs or ETFs, or frankly they could buy individual securities. Uh, but we'd argue broad, diversified baskets of stocks is probably a prudent way to think about getting exposure. And now you have the option of owning market cap strategies and fundamentally weighted strategies over time. Uh, but we would caution all investors, take the time to understand the differences in the methodology, which ultimately leads to very different results over time. So with that, why don't I turn it over to Mike Savage, and then I know we'll come back on and entertain questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, uh, as the case may be. I'd like to take a few minutes and quickly go over the, uh, the methodology again as a, a quick review and then go into some of the ETFs that Schwab uh, offers on some of these products. I'm having a quick uh, difficulty in advancing the slide, so if you can bear with me a moment. Uh, I just advance it for you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see it advanced. Again, I apologize. Yeah. Ah, my apologies. Thank you for your patience. Um, as Rolf reviewed earlier, the fundamental index, as used in the Russell Fundamental Index series and the Schwab uh, ETFs and mutual funds that are managed against the Russell Fundamental Index series is a relatively straightforward concept. It uses three objective measures of value. Uh, the three measures of value are sales adjusted for leverage. And the adjustment for leverage uh, takes into account companies like financial institutions that may generate 
their sales with a higher level of debt and non-financial companies and others that would generate their sales with less debt. And by adjusting for leverage, you make for an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between a company like Bank of America, which would generate its sales with a lot of debt, and a company like Chevron that might not use as much debt to generate its sales. Uh, one outcome of adjusting sales for leverage is that when compared to other fundamental strategies, fundamental index strategies, uh, other alternative beta strategies, and the cap-weighted benchmark, sometimes you'll see lower exposure to the financial sector. Uh, it's not dramatic, but you, you'll see, uh, see an outcome there. Um, it's important to know that none of these three objective measures of value have any predictive value as to what stocks are going to do next month, next six months, next year, or even over longer periods. But they're there to provide an objective measure of value. They are equally weighted. And I did see a question earlier from one of our participants. Thank you for that. Has there been any testing of using weighted averages of these measures instead of an equal weighted average? And I'm not aware of any um, any uh, testing of the using a weighted average method. It depends how you weight them. Certainly weighting them on market capitalization in a non-cap weighted uh, index, like the fundamental index, wouldn't be appropriate. But if you're trying to weight them based on their position within each of the factors, that hasn't been looked at either. But using a, a simple, equally weighted methodology, it's a straightforward uh, process that people can get their arms around. To break the link with price, uh, we use five years of data for each of these three items. If you used one year of sales or cash flow, you might have a higher correlation with the current price of that security. So by going back five years, you tend to break that link with price. Slide 23 has the uh, six Schwab Fundamental Index ETFs. I'll go through them quickly. The Broad Market Index ETF, the Large Company Index ETF, the Small Company, International Large and Small, and of course what we're discussing today is the Schwab Fundamental Emerging Markets Large Company Index ETF. Tickers and expense ratios are there. Uh, we launched these six ETFs in August of 2013 and are pleased uh, that from a standing start, we have nearly $400 million in assets under management uh, at the current time. And we've seen broad acceptance from a full range of, of customers, both um, retail and, and advisors and on-platform and off-platform. So we're really quite pleased with the acceptance we've seen of the methodology. I would point out that while we've only had less than a year of data on these six ETFs, we do have five fundamental index mutual funds that are managed against uh, five of the six uh, Russell Fundamental Index series. So if anyone is interested in looking at uh, performance over longer actual periods, uh, please feel free to grab the Fundamental Index, the Schwab Fundamental Index Mutual Funds um, as a proxy uh, in looking at performance for the, um, the ETFs. And I won't go through this next chart in great length because it's been referred to, I think, in Tony and Rolf's presentation. But it's clearly, clearly important to know what you have in terms of sector weights. Uh, country weights are particularly important in my view because while it's not always the case, I think many times performance of an emerging markets fund, whether it's cap weighted or fundamental index, has to do, at least in part, with the country weightings. And as I think everyone on the call understands, many indices treat emerging countries differently. Some treat South Korea, for instance, as a developed market. So it's important to know what you have. And uh, we listed here we have the country and sector weights uh, for the top five uh, for the emerging markets uh, large company ETF. The bottom part I just point out is that uh, many times the methodology used in the Russell Fundamental Index series as well as the, the funds that are managed against that series result in a number of a reduction in the number of names. And that's uh, important in uh, the emerging market space. It's uh, critical to strike a balance between broad market exposure and keeping your names to a minimum because uh, in, transaction, in, trans in transacting uh, securities in the local markets and the local currencies, a fewer number of names while maintaining the broad market exposure helps keep transaction costs down. So that's uh, of some value. I'd also Mike, point uh, out just can, I, can I just chime in really quickly here? Um, what are we looking at exactly? The ETF versus the index, the, 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 the discrepancy between those two figures. Uh, what index are we talking about, just for clarity's sake here? Relative? Yes, thank, thank you, Wally. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I would point that out. Several of the previous slides use the Russell Emerging Markets Index as the uh, cap-weighted comparable. For this slide, um, we are using the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, which is the cap-weighted index we show on our fact sheets. So when you look at a Schwab uh, ETF, Fundamental Index ETF fact sheet, at least in emerging markets, it's uh, shown against the MSCI Emerging Markets. Thank you for that, Ollie. And comparing the last uh, bottom chart there shows that, um, as expected, as is many times the case, the fundamental index methodology improves your value metrics a little bit. And as shown here, you see lower price to earnings and lower price to book ratios, which I think is, uh, it is important. So with that, I think I will stop, hand it back to uh, Ollie, if that's OK, and see if there are some questions that we can all answer. Great. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Um, we definitely have time for questions, which is great, and uh, we've, we've got a, a lot of them. Uh, one of them that just came, uh, this is more of a housekeeping question. Uh, yes, these slides will be available uh, 24 to 48 hours um, after this webinar, and we'll certainly let you know how to obtain those slides uh, in, in an email. And I'll remind you again, but it is available. Uh, and again, also, if any of you want to ask any questions, uh, you can do so at the lower right of your screens. So feel free to do so. Uh, let's start with, um, Tony, let's go back to that. I think it was slide 16, uh, really quick. Um, there was that, that the plethora of, of the flags, and you kind of demonstrate, thank yep. you, the return dispersions. Something Rolf said early in this presentation, and Rolf, you might want to take a crack at this question as well. Um, when there's such broad dispersion, is, is it an opportune time to make use of active management? I'm wondering, how do you respond to that? If an investor comes at you with that sort of response, how does the fundamental index uh, stack up against that sentiment that, that someone wants to go after some alpha with some educated guesses about you know the, the, the distinct geopolitical stories and, and, and what have you? Yeah, and, and Ali, I think as we've shared on uh, previous webinars, we do have a point of view that it's not active versus passive, it's active and passive. And, and we would argue in the less efficient markets like the emerging markets, there is value to be had in, in deploying an active manager. And again, we would say favor active managers who have historically uh, done a better job protecting on the downside because that's where a manager could avoid you know, the big potholes, whether it's at a country level or at a company level. So there is value to be had. We would view one as a complement to another. And um, and I would argue, you know, with things getting a little bit volatile now, where there maybe are exciting opportunities in, in one part of the emerging market, we're certainly seeing some disruption in areas like Russia. An active manager can help navigate uh, more efficiently across those market segments. And Ollie, I would okay. add to that. I, you know, I think the point I tried to make is, you know, this is an indication of market dispersion. So there's a, you know, a much broader range of performance outcomes, whether you're looking across countries or securities. And in those sorts of environments, the, the point I was making is there's generally a bigger payoff. You know, if you make a bet, there's a bigger payoff for being right. Also recognize there's, a, there's a, a bigger downside for being wrong. But the point is, if you're making bets against the cap-weighted market and those bets are right, you know, those will generally have a much higher payoff in these sorts of situations. So when you're talking about this active-passive decision, um, you know, and I, I don't like to categorize it so broadly, I think it's important to recognize that it's really a, a, a question of how much ownership the investor wants to take in the decisions being made, to, you know, to take bets. So if once you understand how the fundamental methodology works, you understand what sort of bets it's going to take, and those will be done on a very rules-based and transparent basis, you can own that decision, and, and to the extent those are right, you'll you'll get these bigger payoffs when there's more market dispersion. Versus, you know, potentially delegating to a more professional active manager who you believe has insights, who can make explicit forecasts, who potentially can be more subjective or have some discretion on, on how to find those opportunities. You know, those become the decision points for then whether you you do this with an active strategy or or the fundamental strategy. And Ollie, uh, could I just yeah. could I just interject on that because. Uh, I, I think Ralph said something which is very important. These are all rules-based strategies. So I know some people in the marketplace refer to fundamental strategies as as active. In our view, technically they're 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 not active. They they are rules-based. They follow a discipline over time. Although that rebalancing does uh, allow you to uh, 
buy low and sell high, and, and you'd argue there's kind of a quasi-active component kind of built into it. But I think definitionally it's really important to distinguish. They're not active strategies in the way that I was describing it, hiring a manager who's making fundamental decisions and really trying to outperform the market. And I think some people do get confused with fundamental and, and think there's an active component built in there. Although there is a perception, maybe, Rolf, you want to take a crack at this. I'll circle back to you, Mike. I have something in mind for you momentarily. But, but Rolf, with regards to what Tony just said, th there's certainly a mentality out there among investors, and even if what uh, Tony is saying is, is strictly true when you really look at the, 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 the fact that it is rules-based, um, is it useful in some sense to think of these uh, strategies as active in some sense to the extent that investors who want outperformance can get outperformance in this, you know, what Rob Arnott calls active and drag, which is actually a rules-based strategy. So it's sort of a, you know, it's semantical, but it may be an important distinction to the extent that the population of investors that want outperformance can really get it here and relatively in an, in an affordable manner, really, relatively speaking, right? Yeah, and I, like I said, I think, you know, it's, it's increasingly difficult, if not impossible now, to just have a simple, broad classification of whether it's active or passive. I think what's really happening is there are a variety of dimensions now that we can think about something being more active versus more passive. So, in a, you know, I think the point I would make is, you know, to the extent you are now making bets that deviate from cap weighting, those are considered active decisions from sort of traditional financial theory. And <clears throat> as you suggest, you know, that's, that's the only way you can outperform is to take bets, you know, away from the market. So that, that gives you an opportunity to outperform. However, I think as, as Tony emphasized, you know, these are rules-based, which means we're not making explicit forecasts. You know, we're following the rules. There's no discretion being used. So to me, that's, that's the realm of true active management when you're hiring someone who you believe has insight, who, you know, potentially is using discretion and making judgments about relative values and can make decisions, you know, on the fly, so to speak, you know, that's what you're paying to get for active management. So, again, you know, the point I always make is markets could be going up, markets could be going down. If you look at what we're going to do with the fundamental index strategy, in either case, we're going to follow the rules. We're going to rebalance the indexes, you know, at the points we said we were. We're not going to try to, you know, change the rules to exploit market conditions or as a reaction to something. So, again, it puts more ownership on the investor for the decisions they're making with respect to the bets they're taking. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, lest I leave you out in the cold here, uh, we've been talking a lot about emerging markets, um, noisy prices. Now, when you talk about that noisiness, does that call into question the quality of the data used in determining the fundamental index weightings? Uh, we, we don't think so. You know, the, the uh, technical uh, definition of the index is the large company emerging markets index. So we're talking about approximately 225 or 30 of the largest uh, companies in the emerging markets universe. So we think the data there, um, and as Rolf alluded to earlier in the presentation, the use of sales, cash flow, and dividends lends itself to reasonable consistency across countries and companies. You combine that with a focus on the large company um, uh, focus, uh, you, we think we improve the quality of the data. Interestingly, Robert and I was asked this question uh, several months ago, or perhaps even longer, and someone said, hey, do you, do, you, do you believe the data, do you have faith in the data of the emerging markets, and will this fundamental index apply in those market se segments? And his response was, yeah, I believe the data as much as I do in the developed markets. So I thought that was uh, sort of sort of telling, um, but uh, we think we think the quality of this data, particularly with regard to these three factors, um, in these companies, is pretty good. And you talked about the the existence of the Schwab uh, uh, open end mutual funds that have many of the same strategies. Five of the six. Um, first of all, is there anything about the the, rel the each uh, respective wrap or ETF versus mutual fund that, that is distinct and event, uh, investors maybe should think about carefully in the, in the case of these fundamental strategies? And, and just for the record, what is the ETF, the sixth one, that's not uh, included in the, uh, in the quintet of, uh, of the mutual funds? Yes, thank you for that. The sixth ETF that it does not have a mutual fund counterpart is the broad market um, fundamental index ETF, and it's simply a combination of the U.S. large and the U.S. small uh, fundamental index. Uh, so we have the five mutual funds, U.S. large and small, international large and small, and the emerging markets. All of those have been outstanding for five years. And we're quite pleased to be able to offer this strategy in both a mutual fund format and an ETF format. I mean, as much as anyone else, we've seen the growth in the ETF business across uh, 
um, sectors and across uh, product types. From a standing start in 2009, Schwab has more than $20 billion in assets uh, under management in ETFs. We think ETFs are here to stay. Um, we've been surprised a bit and interested to see how our investor base are using ETFs. Uh, you know, some of the some of the factors are uh, taxes because of the underlying mechanics of how ETFs are managed. They are often, although not always, able to reduce the amount of capital gains and losses that are distributed to investors. And for that reason, at the margin, we see some investors using ETFs in. Taxable, uh, taxable accounts where they avoid those capital gains and losses and might use the mutual fund in a, in a tax-free account where taxes are less of an issue. So we, uh, we see, see growth in the, in the ETF business um, across the board, cap-weighted in fundamental indexes, and are, again, pleased to be able to offer this strategy in, in two formats. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Tony, uh, at the risk of opening Pandora's box here, but how, how, how should advisors select among the different uh, enhanced beta, smart beta, strategic beta options that, that are now out, out in the marketplace. And, I, and I, certainly among them are these fundamental ones that we're talking about uh, in such detail this afternoon. Yeah, and I, and I think maybe even just definitionally how do, how do we think about this broad categorization. I mean, we tend to think the larger family, these non-cap-weighted strategies, um, you know, that's fine as an initial grouping, but you do need to spend the time to understand what is the underlying methodology? Fundamental strategies are very different than equal weight strategies, which are very different than low vol or min variance type strategies. So we, we've actually done some work on this. And if anyone's interested on the, the Schwab website, we've uh, published a white paper on alternative beta strategies where we spend the time to kind of strip down some of the most popular strategies in the marketplace. And we start by what is the underlying methodology? And the methodology certainly points to the screening and weighting and, and how these strategies will differ over time. We then point to the underlying index. The index will have an impact on how uh, the strategies perform and what some of the characteristics that will fall out of the methodology. And then as we peel back the onion layer by layer, <coughs> excuse me, we look at things like sector concentrations, value versus growth tilts, uh, capitalization, and even looking at things like um, you know, how have they performed, you know, in, in different sort of market environments. And not surprisingly, depending on that methodology, some of these strategies are going to deliver very different results to, uh, to other strategies. And oftentimes they sound similar, but the results are quite different over time. So I, I think the beauty of the world that we live in is there's a great deal of transparency out there. And if you take the time to understand the methodology and peel back that onion one layer at a time, I, I think you start to see a very different picture over time. Then I think an advisor is is better able to discern how these strategies are going to perform in a given market environment. Yeah, thanks. I would definitely encourage uh, uh, everyone to g gather as much information because a lot of people are talking about it these days, and and uh, consensus is something I think one arrives at almost individually. It's it's, it's a complex topic. Thank you, Tony. It was a, a thoughtful answer. Uh, Rolf, um, put on your seatbelt. We're getting some some tough questions from the audience. Um, uh, here's one. Uh, indexes don't typically allocate to cash, uh, but given the higher correlations that have been seen in recent uh, times, certainly after the crash, does it not make sense to allocate to cash during a plunging market rather than rotating to a better value position? And this goes right to the heart of what the um, what this methodology does, right? It sort of tends to rotate into value positions, right? Yeah, I think obviously that's probably more of an asset allocation question, you know, which would be based on an investor's particular objectives and circumstances. You know, in our world, we're really, you know, still trying to get at a specific component or segment of the market. Um, and, you know, and, and strictly speaking, we don't try to represent any form of cash because that potentially would be an allocation decision, which is different for every investor. So I think the idea is if you, the investor, are trying to make some decision of, you know, the equity market versus cash allocation in your portfolio, We'll provide the equity exposure and, and do that in the best way possible, whether that's cap-weighted or fundamentally weighted, and then you need to make that decision based on your own circumstances for how much cash you're willing to hold. But and, and here's, I think, the, the real key point here. You, you, you can take comfort in the fact that we, the index provider, are not sort of counteracting any decision you make. If, if we were to start holding cash in the index in some fashion, you know, now you'd have to start taking into consideration, well, how much cash does the index hold versus how much I want, and, and what if that changes? So I think you can see where what you really want from us is more, you know, the purest exposure for whatever segment or strategy we're trying to represent in the marketplace. 
Yeah, fair enough. That's a that's a good uh, good question, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tony, maybe this is for you, or perhaps Mike. I'm not sure which. Either of you could take a crack at it. Are, are there tax advantages of ETFs versus mutual funds also pre present uh, here, and 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 also comparing to, to separately managed accounts uh, from a tax perspective? Uh, how much advantage is there in SMAs versus mutual funds, and, and can you point to any white papers from within Schwab or elsewhere that would sort of shed light on this important issue? Mike, maybe I'll go first. I, I think ETFs generally, because of the creation and redemption process and the in-kind transfer, you're, you're generally going to get a better tax treatment with your ETF. Um, you know, index-based strategies, I think, tend to be more tax efficient than, uh, than active managers. Most active managers don't spend a lot of time thinking about taxes. Now, some do, but, but most don't. So as we think of them, we, we tend to think that uh, an ETF is going to be the most tax efficient, an index-based fund will be more tax efficient, and then a separate account is, is unfortunately not really uh, typically managed for taxes, so you're going to bear a tax burden there. And, and we have done some work on this, Ali, and, and I'll have to follow up with you after the call on how we might want to distribute some of that information. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that the tax efficiency as applies to the fundamental index is really limited to the discussion on ETFs uh, versus mutual funds. And the underlying mechanics of an ETF, and that's consistent whether it's a cap-weighted ETF or a fundamental index and the weighted uh, ETF, uh, provides a reduction often, not always, in uh, distributions of gains and losses. Uh, we don't have a specific paper on the fundamental index uh, tax efficiency issue. However, I believe there is a paper uh, on our ETF website that discusses the somewhat tax efficient nature of ETFs in general, and I would refer uh, any of the listeners to that. Thank you. Um, Rolf, this is a very granular question. Uh, international low volatility indexes seem to have a very different makeup by country and sector. Uh, so are the differences in fundamental indexes solely based on how the factors are weighed, weighted in those indexes? Uh, no. I think you know, it's important. You know, We definitely think about low volatility or what we call defensive strategies as another form of smart beta. But it's really you know, two distinct objectives that are then you know, causing the, the types of stocks to be different. So in a, in a more low volatility or defensive framework, the universe of stocks you're trying to select are those that potentially have lower historical volatility. And in Russell's case, we also look for higher quality. And so obviously that group of stocks you know, we'll have a particular makeup versus on the fundamental side, we're starting with, you know, the broad universe of stocks and then, you know, really just changing the weighting, which then results in its unique profile. So really two distinct processes going on, one obviously being engineered to produce a lower volatility, higher quality outcome versus fundamental, which is trying to overcome some of the flaws of cap weighting. And then those, those produce different sorts of structures to those indexes. Can you turn uh, our... Uh our guests' attention to where on the Russell website they can uh, they can find information. There's there, there certainly curiosity about finding out how these detail, how these index, indexes are constructed. There's questions about rebalancing. How often is the rebalancing? Uh, if you can just answer that one straight away and then uh, segue to the, uh, the information on the website, please. Sure, and I think one of the question about rebalancing was what about what, what the the, uh, the the participant says asynchronous data. So the fact that companies potentially file on different cycles, um, you know, it's not it, it's something we don't try to overcome individually. But our, our formal reconstitution period is in June, and that's true for both the cap weighted family as well as the fundamental family. The idea being that most annual filings for, for U.S. companies and potentially you know non-U.S. companies are in by then. But I think it is important for investors to recognize that as an index provider, you know, we're not like an active manager where we're actually trying to, you know, improve upon the standard sorts of data feeds that we're getting, whether that's, you know, aligning based on reporting or, or scrubbing data, you know, beyond a certain level of quality or, or even normalizing for different, you know, industry, industry differences. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that we're using best available data and, uh, and doing what we can to keep the quality of that high. But otherwise, that's what you pay active management for, is to get some of these higher levels of, of, of uh, information out of the data. And the website is, if you go to www.russell.com slash indexes, all of our construction and methodologies are available for, for every index. Thank you, Ralph. That's, uh, that's about all the time we have uh, right now. Uh, so that concludes our expert series webinar on take advantage of market inefficiency with fundamental indexes. Ralph, Tony, and Mike. Thanks for being my guests, and I want to also thank the audience for attending and for all your thoughtful questions.
Uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, the presentation will be available to all of you in 24 to 48 hours, and you'll receive instructions on how to obtain the slides in an email. On that note, uh, on behalf of my guests from Russell and Schwab, as well as my colleagues here at ETF.com, I'm Ollie Ludwig, wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon.